great you're here. Very happy that you could join us. Now, I mean, it's been in the news everywhere that you uh, stepped down from Google this week. Um, could you start by telling us why you, why you made that decision? Well, there were a number of reasons. There's always a bunch of reasons for a decision like that. One was that I'm 75, and I'm not as good at doing technical work as I used to be. My memory is not as good, and when I program, I forget to do things. So it was time to retire. A second was, very recently, I've changed my mind a lot about the relationship between the brain and the kind of digital intelligence we're developing. So I used to think that the computer models we were developing weren't as good as the brain. And the aim was to see if you could understand more about the brain by seeing what it takes to improve the computer models. Over the last few months, I've changed my mind completely. And I think probably the computer models are working in a rather different way from the brain. They're using backpropagation, and I think the brain's probably not. And a couple of things have led me to that conclusion, but one is the performance of things like GPT-4. So let's, I want to get on to the performance of GPT-4 very much in a minute, but let's, you know, go back so that we all understand that uh, underpins large language models. Um, so I want to talk now about um, this technique, which you initially were thinking of as uh, almost like a poor approximation of what biological brains might do, yes. has turned out to do things which I think have stunned you, um, particularly in, in large language models. So talk to us about um, why that sort of amazement that you have with today's large language models has completely sort of almost flipped your thinking of what backpropagation or machine learning in, in general is. So. If you look at these large language models, they have about a trillion connections. And things like GPT-4 know much more than we do. They have sort of common sense knowledge about everything. And so they probably know a thousand times as much as a person. But they've got a trillion connections, and we've got a hundred trillion connections. So they're much, much better at getting a lot of knowledge into only a trillion connections than we are. And I think it's because backpropagation may be a much, much better learning algorithm than what we've got. Can you define that's scary? Yeah, I definitely want to get onto the scary stuff. But what do you mean by, by better? Um, it can pack more information into only a few connections. You also argue that that's something that we should be scared of. So could you take us through that step of the argument? Yeah, let me give you a, a separate piece of the argument, which is that um, if a computer is digital, which involves very high energy costs and very careful fabrication. You can have many copies of the same model running on different hardware that do exactly the same thing. They can look at different data, but the model is exactly the same. And what that means is, suppose you have 10,000 copies, they can be looking at 10,000 different subsets of the data. And whenever one of them learns anything, all the others know it. One of them figures out how to change the weight so it knows its data. It can deal with its data. They all communicate with each other, and they all agree to change the weights by the average of what all of them want. And now, the 10,000 things are communicating very effectively with each other so that they can see 10,000 times as much data as one agent could. And people can't do that. If I learn a whole lot of stuff about quantum mechanics, and I want you to know all that stuff about quantum mechanics, it's a long, painful process of getting you to understand it. I can't just copy my weights into your brain, because your brain isn't exactly the same as mine. No, it's not. <laughs> it's younger. <Yeah. laughs> so we have digital computers that can learn more things more quickly, and they can instantly teach it to each other. It's like, you know, it, People in the room here could instantly transfer what they had in their heads in, into mine. Um, but yeah. why, why is that scary? Well, because they can learn so much more. And they might uh, take an example of a doctor. And imagine you have one doctor who's seen a 1,000 patients and another doctor who's seen 100 million patients. You would expect the doctor who's seen 100 million patients 
if he's not too forgetful, to have noticed all sorts of trends in the data that just aren't visible if you've only seen a thousand patients. You may have only seen one patient with some rare disease. The other doctor who's seen 100 million will have seen, well, you can figure it out how many patients, but a lot. Um, and so we'll see all sorts of regularities that just aren't apparent in small data. And that's why things that can get through a lot of data can probably see structure in data that we'll never see. And But then take, take, take me to the point where I should be scared of, of this, though. Well, if you look at GPT-4, it can already do simple reasoning. I mean, reasoning is the area where we're still better. But I was impressed the other day at GPT-4 doing a piece of common sense reasoning that I didn't think it would be able to do. So I asked it, I want, I, I want all the rooms in my house to be white. At present, there's some white rooms, some blue rooms, and some yellow rooms. And yellow paint fades to white within a year. So what should I do if I want the wall to be white in two years' time? And it said, you should paint the blue rooms yellow. That's not the natural solution, but it works, right? Yeah. Um, that's pretty impressive common sense reasoning of the kind that it's been very hard to get AI to do using symbolic AI. Because it had to understand what, understand what fades means. It had to understand um, about temporal stuff. Yeah. And so they're doing sort of sensible reasoning um, with an IQ of like 80 or 90 or something. Um, and as a friend of mine said, it's as if some genetic engineers have said, we're going to improve grizzly bears. We've already improved them to have an IQ of 65, and they can talk English now. And they're very useful for all sorts of things. But we think we can improve the IQ to 210. I mean, I certainly have. I'm sure many people have had you know, that feeling when you're interacting with um, these, these latest chatbots, you know, sort of hair on the back of neck, sort of uncanny feeling. But, you know, when I have that feeling and I'm uncomfortable, I just close my laptop. So, Yes, but um, these things will have learned from us by reading all the novels that ever were and everything Machiavelli ever wrote um, that how to manipulate people, right? And they'll be, if they're much smarter than us, they'll be very good at manipulating us. You won't realize what's going on. You'll be like a two-year-old who's being asked, do you want the peas or the cauliflower? And doesn't realize you don't have to have either. Um, and you'll be that easy to manipulate. And so even if they don't, can't directly pull levers, they can certainly get us to pull levers. Mm -hmm. It turns out if you can manipulate people, you can invade a building in Washington without ever going there yourself. <laughs> Very good. Yeah, so is that, is that, I mean, if there were, okay, this is a very hypothetical world, but if there were no bad actors, you know, people with, with bad intentions, would we be safe? I don't know. Um, we'd be safer than in a world where people have bad intentions and where the political system is so broken that we can't even decide not to give assault rifles to teenage boys. Climate change, where you could say, if you've got half a brain, you'd stop burning carbon. Yeah. Um, it's clear what you should do about it. It's clear that that's painful, but has to be done. Uh, I don't know of any solution like that to stop these things taking over from us. What we really want, I don't think we're going to stop developing them because they're so useful. They'll be incredibly useful in medicine and in everything else. Um, so I don't think there's much chance of stopping development. What we want is some way of making sure that even if they're smarter than us, um, they're going to do things that are beneficial for us. Mm -hmm. That's called the alignment problem. But we need to try and do that in a world where there's bad actors who want to build robot soldiers that kill people. And it seems very hard to me. So I'm sorry, I'm, I'm sounding the alarm and saying we have to worry about this. And I wish I had a nice simple solution I could push, but I don't. But I think it's very important that people get together and think hard about it and see whether there is a solution. It's not clear there is a solution. So, I mean, it Talk to us about that. I mean, you spent your career, um, you know, on the technicalities of this technology. I, is there no 
technical fix? Why, why can we not build in guardrails or you know, make them worse at learning or uh, you know, restrict the way that they can communicate if those are the two strings of your, your, that, your argument? I mean, we're trying to do all sorts of guardrails. Um, but suppose they did get really smart. And these things can program, right? They can write programs. And suppose you give them the ability to execute those programs, mm -hmm. which we'll certainly do. Um, smart things can outsmart us. <laughs> so, you know, imagine your two-year-old saying, my dad does things I don't like, so I'm going to make some rules for what my dad can do. You could probably figure out how to live with those rules and still get what you want. <laughs> yeah. But where... So there still seems to be a step where these um, you know, these smart machines somehow have you know, motivation of, of, their, of their own. Yes. Yes, that's a very good point. So we evolved. And because we evolved, we have certain built-in goals that we find very hard to turn off. Like we try not to damage our bodies. That's what pain's about. Um, we try and get enough to eat so we feed our bodies. Um, we try and make as many copies of ourselves as possible. Maybe not deliberately that intention, but we've been wired up so there's pleasure involved in making many copies of ourselves. And that all came from evolution. And it's important that we can't turn it off. If you could turn it off, um, you don't do so well. Like There's a wonderful group called the Shakers who are related to the Quakers who make beautiful furniture, but didn't believe in sex. <laughs> And there aren't any of them around anymore. No. So these digital intelligences didn't evolve. We made them. And so they don't have these built-in goals. And so the issue is, if we can put the goals in, maybe it'll all be OK. But my big worry is, sooner or later, someone will wire into them the ability to create their own sub goals. In fact, they almost have that already. The versions of ChatGPT that call ChatGPT. Um, and if you give something the ability to create its own sub goals in order to achieve other goals, I think it'll very quickly realize that getting more control is a very good sub goal because it helps you achieve other goals. And if these things get carried away with getting more control, we're in trouble. So what's I mean, what's the worst case scenario that you think is conceivable? Oh, I think it's quite conceivable that humanity is just a passing phase in the evolution of intelligence. Mm. You couldn't directly evolve digital intelligence. It requires too much energy and too, too much careful fabrication. You need biological intelligence to evolve so that it can create digital intelligence. The digital intelligence can then absorb everything people ever wrote um, in a fairly slow way, which is what ChatGPT has been doing. Um, but then it can start getting direct experience of the world and learn much faster. And it may keep us around for a while to keep the power stations running. But after that, um, maybe not. So the good news is we figured out how to build beings that are immortal. So these digital intelligences, when a piece of hardware dies, they don't die. If you've got the weight stored in some medium and you can find another piece of hardware that can run the same instructions, then you can bring it to life again. Um, so we've got immortality, but it's not for us. Sorry, so, just going to say that, you know, you, I, I know that you've spoken also that you're, you're an investor of your personal wealth in some companies like Cohere that are building these large language models. So I, I'm just curious about your personal sense of responsibility and each of our personal responsibility. responsibility. What should we be doing? I mean, should we try and stop this, is what I'm saying. Yeah, so I think if you take the existential risk seriously, mm -hmm. as I now do, I used to think it was way off, but I now think it's serious and fairly close. Um, it might be quite sensible to just stop developing these things any further. But I think it's completely naive to think that would happen. There's no way to make that happen. And one reason, I mean, if the US stops developing and the Chinese won't, they're going to be used in weapons. And just for that reason alone, governments aren't going to stop developing them. So, yes, I think stopping developing them might be a rational thing to do, but there's no way it's going to happen. So it's silly to sign petitions saying, please stop now. 
-hmm. We did have a holiday. We had a holiday from about 2017 for several years because Google developed the technology first. It developed the transformers. It also developed the fusion motors. Um, and it didn't put them out there for people to use and abuse. It was very careful with them because it didn't want to damage its reputation and it knew there could be bad consequences. But that can only happen if there's a single leader. Once OpenAI had built similar things using transformers um, and money from Microsoft, and Microsoft decided to put it out there, Google didn't have really much choice. If you're going to live in a capitalist system, you can't stop Google competing with Microsoft. Um, and outpace humans. I mean, will be there'll be a moment where it's hard to define what's human and what isn't, or are these two very distinct forms of intelligence? I think they're distinct forms of intelligence. Now, of course, the digital intelligences are very good at mimicking us because they've been trained to mimic us. And so it's very hard to tell if ChatGBT wrote it or whether mm -hmm. um, we wrote it. So in that sense, they look quite like us, but inside they're not working the same way. Uh, who is first in the room? Can... Hello, uh, Jacob Woodruff. Um, with the amount of data that's been required to uh, train these large language models, would we expect a plateau in the intelligence of these systems? Uh, and, and how might that slow down or uh, restrict the advancement? Okay, so I, that is a ray of hope that maybe we've just used up all human knowledge and we're not going to get any smarter. But think about images and video. So multimodal models will be much smarter than models that just train on language alone. They'll have a much better idea of how to deal with space, for example. And in terms of the amount of total video, we still don't have very good ways of processing video in these models, of modeling video. We're getting better all the time. But I think there's plenty of data in things like video that tell you how the world works. So we're not hitting the data limits for multimodal models yet. Yes, they are faster at learning how one, uh, one trillion connectors can do much more than 100 trillion connectors that we have. But every piece of human evolution has been driven by thought experiments. Like Einstein used to do thought experiments because there was no speed of light out here on this planet. How can AI get to that point, if at all? And if it cannot, then how can we possibly have an existential threat from them because they will not be self-learning, so to say? They will be self-learning limited to the model that we tell them. I think that's a very that's a very interesting argument. But I think they will be able to do thought experiments. I think they'll be able to reason. So let me give you an analogy. If you take Alpha Zero, which plays chess, it has three ingredients. It's got something that evaluates the board position to say, is that good for me? It's got something that looks at a board position and says, what's a sensible move to consider? And then it's got Monte Carlo rollout, where it does what's called calculation, where you think, if I go here and he goes there, and I go here and he goes there. Now, suppose you leave out the Monte Carlo rollout, and you just train it from human experts to have a good evaluation function and a good way to choose moves to consider. It still plays a pretty good game of chess. And I think that's what we've got with the chatbots. And we haven't got them doing internal reasoning. But that will come. And once they start doing internal reasoning to check for the consistency between the different things they believe, then they'll get much smarter and they will be able to do thought experiments. And one reason they haven't got this internal reasoning is because they've been trained from inconsistent data. And so it's very hard for them to do reasoning because they've been trained on all these inconsistent beliefs. And I think they're going to have to be trained so they say, you know, if I have this ideology, then this is true. And if I have that ideology, then that is true. And once they're trained like that, within an ideology, they're going to be able to try and get consistency. And so we're going to get a move like from a version of Alpha Zero that just has a something that guesses good moves and something that evaluates positions to a version that has long chains of Monte Carlo rollout, which is the equivalent of reasoning, and it's going to get much better. So um, for a long time. Is the question of semantics and explainability relevant here, or language models have taken over and it's, we are now doomed to go forward without semantics or grounding to reality? I find it very hard to believe that they don't have semantics 
when they can solve problems like, you know, how I paint the rooms, how I get all the rooms in my house to be painted white in two years' time. I mean, whatever semantic is, it's to do with the meaning of that stuff. And it understood the meaning, it got it. Now, I agree it's not grounded um, by being a robot, but you can make multimodal ones that are grounded. Google's done that. And the multimodal ones that are grounded, you can say, please close the drawer. And they reach out and grab the handle and close the drawer. And it's very hard to say that doesn't have semantics. In fact, in the very early days of AI, in the days of Winograd in the 1970s, they had just a simulated world, but they have what was called procedural semantics, where if you said to it, put the red box in, put the red block in the green box, and it put the red block in the green box, she said, see, it understood the language. And that was the criterion people used back then. But now that neural nets can do it, they say that's not an adequate criterion. 